Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next in our series of INSEAD's COVID-19 webinar collection, Crisis Management in COVID-19 Times. My name is David Mayer, and I have the great privilege of being the Secretary General of the INSEAD Alumni Association, and I am also the CEO of Republic Consulting, a reputation management firm based here in Singapore and uh, Sydney. We are joined uh, today with Professor Ludo van der Hayden and Peter Nathaniel, and I will introduce them shortly. The COVID-19 pandemic is often dubbed as an unprecedented crisis, and yet in reality, there are truly few unprecedented crises. The outcome of not learning from the past and the present can be extremely costly uh, during such a circumstance when time is of the essence. And while crisis can come unexpectedly, it typically becomes conquered through a positive combination of talents and competencies. And a method uh, for ensuring the right synergy uh, amongst the people and resources that are engaged. In today's session, Peter Nathaniel and Ludo van der Hayden will illustrate the application and principles of the 5E Fair Process Leadership Framework in the context of managing any crisis, but in particular, the COVID-19 crisis. So I'd like to introduce you to our uh, two speakers today. Ludo van der Hayden has been a professor of technology and operations uh, in, at INSEAD since 1988 and has been the INSEAD Chaired Professor in Corporate Governance uh, since October 2010. He's the founding academic director of INSEAD's Corporate Governance Initiative and with colleagues still co-directs the International Directors Program and the Modern Governance in Banking or IDP for Bankers with Peter. Uh, Peter Nathaniel provides strategic risk management and restructuring advice to major financial institutions central banks, governments, and other international organizations from around the world. He's frequently called on for his expertise as a leading professional in the area of risk management, restructuring, and corporate governance. Peter has been a partner of a boutique merchant banking firm, Impala Partners, since late 2009, and is an adjunct, adjunct professor at INSEAD. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, David. Thank you. Great. We have you online and we can hear you. Um, so let's begin. More than 3 million cases worldwide, 207,000 deaths, hundreds of millions of jobs lost. These grim figures as of today, every one of which has a human being behind it, point not so much to a crisis, but rather a catastrophe. Can you really manage a catastrophe? Um, well, it's sort of a leading question. Uh, you cannot manage the whole catastrophe, but you can manage aspects of it. Uh, so I think uh, that was sort of the observation that led us into writing this paper. Uh, the, the countries that have suffered the most from SARS and uh, MERS and Ebola uh, basically had the best memory of this and, uh, and they've actually reacted the best. So in that sense, countries that have experienced catastrophes before and or, or crises before, but I like your word catastrophes because it's catastrophe happens, whereas crisis is constructed. So it's, um, and it's more, uh, it's a more managerial call. So I would say, yes, you can learn from it. And, and in a crisis, in a catastrophe, it's the, it's the learning and the memory of previous crises uh, that um, actually helps you uh, stay aside, uh, manage well, not go into panic mode. And in a certain way, not construct a crisis that isn't there. And by poor management, uh, you can actually construct a crisis, uh, even when the crisis is not there. So I would say that led to the, the writing of the paper. Uh, and uh, the motivation is there is a science of crisis management. So you cannot just be ad hoc and make things up. 
because the crisis is, is amazingly brutal and it shows in so many ways, you cannot hide from it. So uh, it calls for a science, basically. That, that would be my point. Yeah, and what I would say, David, is uh, in answer to your question, yes, um, it can be um, managed. Uh, and it's really the motivation for, for Ludo's uh, collaboration with Ludo on this, on this paper to show that through some um, theoretical thinking and uh, applying a framework and some practical experience that we can actually um, bring some things to bear with respect to a, a process that might be healthy for people. Uh, to use. What I would say is that um, in every crisis, um, it, 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 a crisis brings with it an inundation of information. Um, and this time it's completely uh, exacerbated by internet and social media. I, I don't have to tell anybody that. Um, both real information and fake information. Um, and the, the level and amount of noise is often disorienting and demoralizing for people. And I think one of the points here was to show that as daunting as it may seem, that uh, no crisis is insurmountable. Uh, if, if you have the right people in the right positions doing and saying the right things to, to focus people's energies and motivation. We've just put a framework around it that describes this process um, to help people lead through the crisis. All right, well, you've spoken of, of your framework and uh to all our audience out there, uh, you did have a, uh, a link to download the INSEAD Knowledge article, which was published, I believe, at the end of March. Um, we'll make that available as well uh, separately uh, at the end of the session. But um, the, the article in the associated working paper that Peter and Ludo, you collaborated on, has a five-phase framework to, to manage uh, during a crisis. So, could you uh, take us uh, through these five steps, step by step? Yes, I think the first thing I will say is that um, uh, first uh, students of mine who've seen uh, sort of this concept of fair process leadership will, will particularly uh, link with this because this is an instance of an application of, of fair process. And I would say uh, that was sort of my motivation, which is the crisis hits people in a very unfair way. Some people die in this case, you know, some people are wiped out, others are not. So the outcomes are extremely unfair. And that's why the management process has to be fair, because otherwise people get very anxious, upset, you know, when people play games with, with, uh, with them, which is they don't, for example, tell them the truth. And, and that was sort of the motivation of the five-step process. We'll go through it. So... Um, this was sort of uh, the point of this figure was to put in one figure, which is way too busy, but all the things that can go wrong and the, the, the systemic aspect uh, I want to underline, which is if you get one of these steps wrong, uh, for example, you're not exploring what could happen. Uh, I would for refer, for example, to the migrant workers uh, in Singapore, which was doing fantastic. But uh, suddenly Singapore discovered that they had 200, 300,000 migrant workers who might be COVID. Uh, so that created a second wave. That is just an omission and is an omission of planning. Uh, and that's a failure of exploration, for example. Now, I would say in crisis, you're going to make lots of mistakes. So the issue is not to be perfect. The issue is to manage the mistakes. And that leads you to the end, which is evaluate and learning and then re-engage people by admitting you've made some mistakes. So uh, it was trying to be helpful, not trying to be the wise man here saying, you know, we know everything uh, that is right. But uh, you need to have a method and the method has to be fair. That's, that's basically what you see. So if we move to uh, what we will do, we'll take you around each of these five phases. If we move to the first phase of engagement um, on the next slide, our plan is uh, to, to highlight a couple in each of these phases. Um, there isn't the, the time here to go through everything. And uh, clearly, if you want to follow up with us or read the uh, working paper, you'll, you'll, you'll get more information on each of these. But um, in the first instance, um, I'm, I'm going to focus on the importance of framing uh, and framing the issue correctly. Uh, and in this case, um, it, it's not hard to see uh, now, in, in retrospect, with the, with the COVID-19 uh, situation, that 
um, many responses, many public policy and governmental responses had uh, framed the issue very differently to the way they're framing it today. For example, um, making it appear to everybody that everyone is equally at risk at all times um, was the, the, the instant response by many governments when in fact it was really, uh, the issue was about resource allocation and identifying those most at risk, like the elderly, the infirmed, or the, or the underserved in inner cities or fringe, fringes of the society, um, and making sure that the, the, resource, the, re, the limited resources available, understanding the shortcomings of prior public policy and health policy, were made available um, for those vulnerable people. So um, the, the focus, this is often referred to as flatten, flattening the curve, you know, as well, this, this other idea of um, distributing the impact on resources over time so that resource, you have the uh, available resources to cope with it. And I would just say that the, the focus on framing what the issues are should really be on the actual issues uh, and its effects and, and, and not... Uh, the crisis of handling the situation, which often we get uh, caught up in. So I'll just leave it at that on framing. Ludo? Yeah, I might add that uh, a point of how you're going to manage this crisis and having a public debate, a bit like in court, you know, uh, saying having a bit of debate early, which is how we're going to deal with that, uh, pres present your method is very reassuring to people and needed because if you're going to say, look, uh, at some point the crisis will appear people will not believe you and it may not happen and and secondly if you say look we're going to come out with the answer uh, you know most people uh, get quite worried about that so uh, the emphasis on how you're dealing with that and who's in charge is it the politicians are it the scientists you know um, and who's responsible for what is very important so you, you talk about the importance of getting the framing right. Are there techniques you can use to ensure that happens or are there stress tests or sanity checks you can apply to make sure you haven't got it wrong? Uh, I think just you, you just said it, which is before you decide to a frame, you know, sort of the key question is, uh, don't we have it wrong? Aren't there alternate framings? So a good debate on alternate framings and these framings are there. You know, they're uh, like if I've been following the situation in France, um, you know, some people said, look, uh, this is just a, a, a seasonal effect. We've seen this before. It will come, it will go. Um, so what's important is treatment and then protect the, the weak people. I mean, that debate better happens before you commit to it publicly. So I think it is not so much the issue of finding other framings. Um, many people and all the experts have a frame. It's actually coming to a frame that is tested by knowledgeable people and also by the public that they can relate to it. So that's again, the, the call for methods and engagement. And just briefly before we move to step two from the audience, how can you lead effectively if you're presenting this as a debate uh, rather than a charging from the front, I guess? Uh, yes, I would say um, don't charge too quickly and have a quick debate. You know, if you're on the Titanic, uh, and you're the captain and you suddenly start charging, everybody around you will be lost and will be wasted. So you need to learn to have debates quickly. And that is why in a crisis, you need to have a command center with, ex with people that are experienced. It's like a board, you know. Uh, in crisis, you can't go around the table with a board because three hours later, you know, you, you haven't yet gotten around the board. So you, you, the crisis method is different than the ordinary method. And I think one of the issues is urgency. But we need to go through the five steps. Yeah. I, I mean, David, I just, just to add, it's, it's really um, one sentence because I don't want to get bogged down on the first phase here. But the, to Ludo's point, the, the circuit time of decision making needs to increase r rapidly or, or decrease the time taken for decisions to find their the, to, to be made and for information to go up to the decision makers, uh, if that's the board, and to return back to uh, people who are executing, needs to contract very rapidly in a crisis. And often that fit makes it feel like uh, boards are actually hands-on and engaged, but that poses another challenge of maintaining their separation from the executive and 
and, and being board members, but having a very close uh, decision-making loop. So I think we should probably leave it at that and move on to the next phase and in interest of time. Okay, great, thanks. Maybe if I can add something before you go, David. Uh, what's important is there is no process without clear leadership. And so this going around the five steps requires a, a somebody in charge. And there is now uh, a little bit, unfortunately, uh, in France, there is a bit of tension between who's the leader of the crisis. Is it the prime minister uh, or is it the president? And these kinds of tensions uh, should be solved beforehand. So, you know, who's responsible for what? And we need to click together because as soon as we are not aligned, that's gonna, the crisis will reveal that. And I was so sad to hear that today when the prime minister is announcing in parliament um, uh, the, how France will deconfine. And of course, the big issue in, in France now is the tension between the president and the prime minister. I mean, that is not the crisis, you know, that is a lack of alignment in leadership. So if we move on to exploration and phase two, um, I'll just highlight the, the second uh, red bullet or highlighted bullet, which is no such thing as having all the information. Um, this is um, almost always the case in a crisis that um, if you have the appropriate sense of urgency, um, you need to have a predisposition to move forward and to act. And it's, it's often the case that people feel uncomfortable because they don't have all the information they need to make the, uh, a good decision. And I, and I would say that uh, having perfect information is not going to happen uh, in, in a crisis. And in fact, it may never happen. Um, and so you, you have to get the bulk of the information you're looking for in the quickest period of time that you have and make a decision and move. And things might change after that, but it, it, the, the disadvantage of not acting um, is, is not worth waiting around trying to get sort of more perfect information. And one of the things, things, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, this is, we don't wanna get into a discussion. You, you're dealing with professors, David, so you have to establish your leadership. So you can shut us up anytime. Uh, however, I would say uh, one of the rules I always have is, is three options, you know, uh, explore three options. What if option one doesn't work? What if option two doesn't work? And, and what is the third option? So that's part of this, this, uh, this, this issue. And the other one, which clearly I think is, is, is so amazing, is segmentation and triage. So you can't deal with everybody the same way. So the whole idea is you have limited resources. Uh, so you need to segment and that's of course behind flattening the curve in the COVID uh, because you're, you can't have enough hospitals and beds for, for treating everyone. Uh, but basically uh, what you want to sort of say is, you know, sort of who's uh, short term we need to treat immediately, um, who, who in the medium term and at the end, you know, uh, these are the people we'll treat later. So really having a, a segmentation uh, this will probably lead that, and this is the most difficult in the global world, is, is that not all countries or not all regions are at the same stage and have to be treated the same. So you're going to have a decentralization of, of solutions. Okay, great. So we can move on now to the, ex, uh, the explanation or explain phase. Yeah. Sure. Luda, do you want to start? Um, Alpant, uh, I think keep explaining what you're doing. I will just have um, one uh, comment and one example. And it's always, I mean, US is fantastic because the shows are so good. But the Cuomo show, the governor of New York, uh, who actually agreed himself that he had, uh, he was not prepared, who also was quibbling with the mayor of New York, de Blasio, uh, I think he's a great example of explain. I mean, his shows, and they're so good that, uh, uh, that presumably what I hear is that Trump is watching Cuomo, you know, he can't stand it because Cuomo is doing so well. So that would be my comment is watch Cuomo about what a leader does in the worst conditions, keeping credibility and, and being very sincere. It's very moving. It's very moving. And what, what I would um, say is the point, the point highlighted here is what is your biggest strategy? 
And it's really about um, keeping a balance between the bigger, the longer term, uh, grander strategy and the short term tactical decisions that need to uh, be made every day and making sure that every one of those short term tactical uh, decisions is consistent with the bigger strategy, but, but also making sure that people understand it because it's, it's often hard to motivate people on very long term strategies in the short term when, their world, when they feel like their world is falling apart around them. Um, telling them about, you know, this is the EU situation where there is, there is real affliction, there are real problems in some of the economies and, the, and a lot of the bureaucrats respond with, well, in 10 years, we will have the following things. Well, 10 years is, is good, but it's not very motivating to people who have short-term um, problems to confront. So a, a balance of the two um, is important for people because it really helps them aligning everybody's energies and motivations. And I think the biggest um, uh, mistake I would say that leaders make is decisions. A crisis requires decisions. Uh, my sort of uh, my summary now is uh, a, a crisis requires a set of decisions and it requires a film. Uh, people want to see the film and, and they want to see the end, you know. And if they see the end, they're willing to watch the next episodes that might be difficult. So it's not just making the decisions but it's showing the film, what's going to happen. And that is, of course, a big, that could be a leadership gamble uh, because uh, the leader himself may not be too convinced uh, that this will work. And so he has to motivate the troops, you know, that uh, the, this, this strategy uh, will work. And, and we want to make sure that it, 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 it doesn't fail because of a lack of commitment. So we all have to go behind this decision because uh, this is the best decision we have. And if we go to the next decision, that will be worse. So let's really make this one work, I think. And then, you know, within the context of a film. So uh, Ludo, you've, you've spoken of the three lines of defense earlier, um, now the, the military strategy. And in your paper, you mentioned uh, Napoleon engaging his imperial army caused widespread panic because everyone knew that was his final move and everything was over. Is yeah. there something you would see as a final move in the COVID battle that we're engaged in now? Oh, I, I would say the, the well, there's there, unfortunately lots of them. Uh, I felt that uh, the ECB uh, very early on shot its final move by sort of committing to the funds too quickly. And so this is very scary. I get scary when you're, when you're on the final move. Uh, I get scary when you're using the last respirator. Uh, I get scary when we're, we don't have a renewal stock of uh, uh, personal equipment. So I don't want to be on the final move. That is what is called the leadership gamble. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I sort of say, you know, what is the third line of defense? And most people sort of know, know um, uh, what the, in the battlefield of Waterloo, people knew that was the last last defense. By the way, that was the wrong call because there was no question that Napoleon could have called a retreat and uh, actually um, they would have been safe. They, they basically lost the battle because of the, the, you know, the, the reckless commitment they made in, in step three. So uh, I would say let's not go there. Uh, leaders want to talk about options and I'm very concerned that the ECB already being at 0% interest rates uh, basically means you have no monetary policy left, you have no bullets in the monetary policy, that they shot their biggest bullets in the beginning. I thought that was amazing. Without negotiation, without commitment from the countries on fiscal policy, and et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, frankly, this worries me about the EU, which is, you know, how many bullets do we have left? Brexit was a lost bullet. And uh, that should be, there should be big learning. But I, 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 have the, I have the impression that in Europe, people say, well, okay, you know, the Brits are difficult, impossible. So this is better. No, 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 no. This is, uh, this is bad news. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, take a bit of a pause here. Uh, we'll look at a couple of questions from the audience, but we've got a poll question for you, our viewers. Um, and the question, if we can pull that up, is 
Uh, do you have confidence in your government's response uh, to the COVID crisis, yes or no? And please be assured that your personal response uh, will uh, remain private. Um, so uh, while you're answering that, uh, we had a question uh, that uh, I think fits in well here, and that is, how do you know when to move on from one stage of the framework to the next? <clears throat> Peter? Well, I, I don't think it's, it, this is not um, a, a mechanical set, you know, this is more conceptual so that you will know because once you've made, for example, once you've, you, you feel as though um, you've got all the information you needed to frame what the issue is, you will know that it's now time to, you know, begin exploring it and going, you know, explaining it to people and, uh, and executing again. So you, you will know that if you don't have a sense of that, the system will start kicking up. This phase, uh, phase framework will start kicking up. And that's when, uh, as Ludo mentioned earlier, you may drop the ball in one of these phases. And if you miss one of the phases, it's because either you're not listening or you're not explaining it well, as in phase three, which is the one on the screen now, um, the, the rest of the system will 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 fail. Um, so I think experience leadership, uh, <clears throat> this is where the combination of people with experience and what we call uh, wisdom um, combines with some process to help make some of those judgments um, on when is the right time to stop, for example, asking for people's input. Okay, that's a classic one. That's that's to do very much with the, um, you know, you're not going to get all the information, all the perfect information. So knowing that you have 75% of the information and that's it, or maybe we need a little more 80% and that's it. That comes from, I think, uh, experienced operators who've been through these before and have a good sense of the, the dynamic between acting and waiting uh, and the impact of, of making those decisions. That, that's my response. Ludo? Uh, I, for me, crisis, uh, the word common, the common use of the word crisis is when the management system has failed. So there is an urgency and you're behind the ball and you need to recover control. So my first answer is good management um, is I think is, is an avoidance of the crisis. So when you're in a crisis, you, that is the difficulty is that you're behind and you need to recover control. And uh, I think that's, that's sort of a very hard to do because if you're permanently behind, you keep losing credibility. And as you lose credibility, you want to somehow show up or, or come stronger. So first, it's good management, which avoids the crisis. If I look at, uh, if, I saw, if I follow what's happening in Taiwan or New Zealand, I, don't, I wouldn't put, I wouldn't put um, a crisis there. I would put a viral event, you know, that we need to manage. This is not crisis. So basically, once you're in crisis, of course, you know it. And the whole idea of fair process is to manage fairly so that you don't get in the crisis. A different subject is you are in the crisis. What do you do? And that's the most difficult part I find. And the, the most difficult part is the people who got you in the crisis are still in charge. But they're also responsible. So how do you deal with that? And I think the answer in, in business is the, the, the duality and the interplay between the executives and the board, which is uh, at some, sometimes the board takes over because it's the CEO who got people into the crisis. And of course, if the CEO got people into the crisis, then uh, he may not be the best person to solve the crisis. So in business, this is hard to do. In government, if you replace the government uh, in crisis, um, you know, that creates another crisis and, and you need to have alignment. I mean, I don't need to replay the film of Churchill uh, taking over, but England was in crisis because it was poorly managed. And then uh, Churchill came into the crisis and got you know, got sort of um, England and Britain and, and the world as well through the crisis. So it's, it's a very difficult um, thing to, to, to manage. Uh, but first, good management reduces the probability of a crisis. Okay. So uh, poll results, 63% said uh, yes, they have confidence. 37% said no. 
Uh, plenty of questions coming in. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And, and uh, Ludo and Peter, you're covering many of them already very well. Thank you. Uh, so maybe if we can move on then to phase four, um, execute. Yeah, I mean, um, you must have uh, read this uh, beforehand, David, because uh, the you question did. you asked you in the last <laughs> phase you. Um, actually um, talked about the contingencies. So we, I think we spent some time already, and Ludo walked through the, the, the examples, whether it was Napoleon or other examples, on... Um, blowing your wad, so to speak, you know, using it all up now and, and it being clear to everyone that you really have no other contingencies. That is a really um, weak position to be in in a crisis, uh, whether you're the ECB, you know, public policy um, or a, a private corporation. I'll focus on bu building trust and credibilities with stakeholders um, based on objective measurement, which touches on the the New York governor point a little bit, or he's perhaps an example of that, uh, the way Ludo described it earlier, which is uh, establishing milestones and targets and goals beforehand, short, short term, as we, we mentioned, um, uh, that are aspirational or achievable, and then actually uh, meeting them um, adds to uh, the credibility of the leadership because you're showing progress against your, sh your set short-term targets and milestones. And um, it, it, it shows people that what, you know, your judgments seem to be right more than they're wrong. That is, you, what you expected to happen is actually happening. And if they didn't know you beforehand, um, they start to get to know you through the decisions and the actions you're taking. And you need, I, I think the, the, the goal here is to make sure that the, ultimately, you know, you're building confidence and trust in the leadership and its decision making, and that the crisis isn't a crisis in confidence of leadership. It's the crisis is the crisis. Make sure the leadership is working, uh, you know, well and has the confidence of its stakeholders. Ludo. Yeah, milestones, measures, you know, what are you measuring? Uh, and the COVID, are you measuring, you know, sort of, uh, uh, people who die, are you, for me, the key measurement is sort of new cases. That's the key. Uh, the thing that I find uh, most reassuring or most credible is world dometers, you know, where you have these, these statistics of new, of new cases and deaths. I think that's what people want to hear. You know, when they see the curve rise, they're worried and they know they're in trouble. Uh, when they see the curve go down, they sort of, uh, they, they, they sort of are in better shape. So, this is where uh, at, at the previous step, you basically said, look, these are the key numbers you have to watch for. And that's the bet. And the question is, do you understand the crisis or do you not understand the crisis? And, and once you put in numbers, then you have to show that these numbers are going down as you expected. And I think that is sort of what I think uh, has partly been missed because as we go in, you have, you know, as I mentioned in Singapore, you know, the migrant workers, but in Western countries, suddenly you have in the midst of step four, you have these old people who've been forgotten. And, and that is in Canada, in the US, in France, in Belgium, unbelievable. That of course is extremely scary and, and will not create trust and credibility in the leadership because that should not come sort of unannounced. And, and I think that that is what you want to avoid in a crisis. You may have been surprised to be in a crisis, but the more things happen as you, as you said they would happen, um, then I think the, the, better off, uh, the better off you are. And, and when the numbers, when the, the actuals do not match the results, you know, you're in trouble. So, so that element of communicating the progress uh, that you uh, recommend uh, making, uh, the number of lives saved, uh, for example, I'm not really seeing that a lot at the moment, um, either with governments or with the media. Is that just really kind of a bad news predicament at the moment? Bad yeah, news I, think, sells I, I, I would say uh, this is, a, this is a, a, we don't really understand the virus completely. Uh, you know, the Nobel Prize in Medicine in France basically said there, there are HIV mini sequences in the virus. This is extremely scary, of course. Um, so it's a virus we don't quite understand. But what we do understand is that it hits the old people almost in an exponential way compared to the others. 
So the fact that we give these aggregate numbers, instead of giving the numbers by age category, you know, sort of active people, young people, babies, older people like me, what's so difficult about it? I mean, you, you need to have four kinds of, of, of uh, numbers you look at. And, and the real issue is how many old people can we save? Uh, but but the the idea of, of of and that is why I think the numbers are actually this is terrible. But the numbers proportionally uh, are not necessarily that bad. Every death is tragic. You know, every accident is tragic. Every loss of a family member is tragic. Every student who dies is tragic. So that's not that is that should be given. But the the way the numbers are reported. I would say create a panic mode, which is, is, is not reassuring because it's, it's a complete aggregate. And, and of course, this is what the, the most scary thing is, which is, you know, instead of saying, wash your hands, uh, have a mask, uh, you know, take a shower, keep your distance. Um, instead of actually saying you could manage, you know, your own defense system, you know, uh, the message is everybody can be hit. Well, you know, that's true as well. Uh, everybody can, can be hit by a car. So, so that's not, I would say, managerial language that's very useful. And I think that's part of what we're talking about here. Great. Can, I, can I just say that, you know, there's, a, there's another potential um, perspective on this, which is the, that the panic um, is really a result of a heightened anxiety that was around in countries that, I mean, people may not have had the full faith and confidence in their institutions, governmental or otherwise, um, for a period of time that, that has, has heightened the, the level of anxiety in countries and therefore the vulnerability to any um, type of event like this, so that if they didn't trust their institutions before something like this, then they're certainly not going to trust them in the first reaction to something like this. And, you know, some of the panic and it looks like it's uh, a little bit of a breakdown in the unwritten contract of trust between people and their, their leaders and their institutions in, in, in many countries right now. But, you know, it's a slightly different angle to it, but they, this is where leadership needs to restore that trust and either by putting different faces up in front of the people or staying, you know, certain, based on good advice, certain faces that don't have trust, but get them out of the spotlight. I mean, there has to be an approach to it. In the private sector, you can deal with it a lot easier. In the public sector, it's hard because politicians like to um, keep their seats. Yes. Great. Um, okay, can, uh, if we can take a look at uh, phase five. Well, I think we talked about that as, uh, as well, which is, is the people who evaluated previous crisis uh, that, uh, you know, are best positioned to deal with the current crisis. I mean, that was the object of the paper, which is, uh, of course, this is new. Uh, there is something absolutely new in this, which is the whole economy is still, but all the capital is there, all the factories are there. So this is a little virus, which has actually created a, an economic crisis, which is it will probably go, might go back to 29 or something like that, or to 2007 to uh, 2008. I would say part of this is, is, is constructed, you know, because it's, again, it's not going to hit all countries the same. And not all countries have had to have radical uh, stops. But um, you have to reassess continuously. And uh, I think the big crisis in France seems to be that uh, there are no masks. That's a supply chain issue. That's a... That's a, a you know a health uh, public health issue, and um, basically uh, somebody made a decision uh, and that uh, kept going on and and nobody sort of said is that really what we want to do, and um, so I would say um, it is what you learn in the army, which is the army always gets ready for the previous war because they had all the lessons from the previous war, and now the question is. Um, you know, can you, can you fight the new one? Because there are new elements, but there are many routines, protocols that we can use from previous crises and, and um, evaluation is there, but the other part in the paper is also <clears throat> adapting, adapting uh, to the world. So I think, I do think that uh, the world will learn from this. And uh, that is, I think, hopefully, 
what's going to happen, which is the world after will be different. And there will be so many things to learn. And of course, one of the things to learn is about public health. The other things to learn is about uh, globalization, uh, you know, the extent of globalization. Uh, I think the other thing to learn is, is you know, the probably the humanity of people. There's a display of humanity, which is remarkable. You know, people are, are, are taking care of other people without masks, exposing themselves the percentage of uh, SOS Médecins that well, you know had the COVID was I think something like 30% in the early phases. So the amount of sacrifice and humanity, which is, is, which is remarkable, uh, I think uh, we wanna make, make sure that the world is, is not just an economic engine, but that it's a human engine. And I think that will be also the learning. But basically it's the people who have failed before that are most prepared for today but uh, it's it's failure is good if you learn from it if you have a thorough evaluation exercise and what the paper says is that should be ongoing while you're fighting the crisis so it shouldn't be sort of a five-year five-year exercise uh, you know uh, the western countries didn't learn from china um, well china wasn't sort of really uh, drawing the bell the chinese scientists have been extraordinary uh, in terms of, of getting the news out. The Chinese government has been certainly less extraordinary or extraordinary in the other side. Um, but the, the online learning, uh, I, I'm in Switzerland. I really think that people were looking at, at Italy and saying, you know, well, the, the, the virus will stop at the border. You know, this is Italy. Switzerland is not Italy. Well, actually, it, it didn't stop. And so people weren't even learning online and so basically you know everybody is sort of watching at, at Italy but not evaluating you know could this come here uh, what happens are we ready uh, you know do we start uh, buying ventilators etc people weren't doing that so so very often the crisis is a result of not having learned from previous crisis or from what's happening in the world Okay, thanks. Again, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll turn to some questions from uh, our viewers. And while we're doing that, we have a second poll for you. If we can pull that up, please. It, uh, the question is, do you feel that governments are learning from the pandemic and gaining control over it? Uh, so one of the questions we had uh, earlier was, how early in the piece should you start planning uh, the end game and your, and your exit? Uh, and and the rebuilding process. Uh, maybe over to you, Peter. I, I think that the end game, it, it's very unnatural for most people entering into a crisis to think about the end game and the exit and sort of life after the crisis. It's an unnatural process when you uh, suddenly are in a crisis and everyone is focused on the fire in front of them and putting it out. Um, but it's essential and often you need to have different group, a different group of people thinking about those things while uh, one group is, is actually fighting the fires. But uh, as soon as possible, if you haven't already thought about it in your, you know, your preparedness uh, for, for a crisis. Again, uh, what tips it, things over um, to cause a crisis may be it, it's sort of one thing but the effects, the effects seem to uh, be relatively understood. The severity may change, but the effects of, of crises in whichever way they manifest seem, seem to have a lot of parallels throughout time. So those, that preparedness and that planning and those contingencies can be done uh, well ahead of time. And I think if you can put in a sort of life after the crisis uh, element to that before, that's, that would be ideal. But if, if, if not, then as soon as a crisis uh, comes about, there needs to be somebody, some team thinking about um, what life looks like. I, I would give you that, an, a very brief example on that. Um, it, when, the, when the UK uh, banking system basically went down in 2007, 2008, um, that was a conversation that some of us were having with the um, the authorities in the UK at the time, which was uh, I un you know we understand we're in the midst of this this sort of meltdown and and, and the failure in the banking system, um, but you also need to bear in mind what the new economic model for the country is given the, the 
current one, which was services and financial services in particular, led for the prior generation, really, since Thatcher's time. Um, what's the new economic model after you get through all this? And, you know, the, the response was, um, that's right, but, you know, we here right now can't think about that. We need to have other people think about that. The truth is, it never really did get thought through at the time, nor immediately after, um, really, the, re the rejection of Brown in the next uh, election, uh, with, the, with Cameron coming in as a conservative, you know, with a conservative government, never really articulated the new economic model for the country. And whilst the effects aren't immediate, uh, you know, some might say that led into the discontent that really um, percolated and resulted in, in people's uh, voting to leave the European Union, ultimately, when they couldn't, when political leaders couldn't explain a new sustainable economic model for the country and those that were left out, you know, felt, you know, left out uh, indefinitely. So that's just a, a, an example, but um, I just wanted to make that, uh, that point. Yep, great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, all results, say, sorry, go ahead. Luda. Yeah, a little, a little example is uh, George Marshall. Uh, George Marshall was the chief of staff of Roosevelt in World War II. Uh, he was a master. Uh, his name is not so well known in military, but he was the one who was overseeing all of the U.S. war effort. Uh, but then I would say uh, he's also better known as the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan was actually the uh, saving Germany, you know, from this, this uh, disaster. So at some point, Marshall, you know, started to plan after the war. And he basically says to Eisenhower, you know, just mop up and finish up. So I, what I do think is the people who are fighting the fire cannot also uh, think about rebuilding the house. And I think, at, I, I think rebuilding the house is important uh, because that gives hope. And, and so you need to have these two. How you, how you play these two uh, and how you present these two, um, I think is, is, um, is, is sort of more delicate. We could speak more about that, but you need to have uh, both. So you need to have a... a a team that fights the fire. You need to have a team that says, "How do we going to exit out of the fire?" And then, how do we build the new, the new, the new world? Uh, and I think that's. I hope that that's going to be a big part of the recovery, which is, uh, you know, we need another world. And after um, this little virus, you know, there is climate change. There are other things, and it could be that uh, the most hopeful thing is that the, the coronavirus reminds us of how fragile and how interconnected we are and how humble we need to be. And that's exactly what we need to solve the climate change because climate change will not be a small coronavirus. You know, it's gonna hit and it's hitting the whole world. And so uh, that could be, that is part of, I would say, what we call step five. And, and that, is not, uh, that is not just a meeting and a report that is presented to Congress that is actually a real step that then leads to engaging again, and that is the cyclic nature of the model, that leads you to re-engage other people who will build a new world once we have uh, taken care of the current crisis. Yeah, can, can I just say, David, that's, that's the, the part that you know, we're at now in these five phases we have here. So the, the final closure of the loop is based on this, uh, admission and reassessment and understanding uh, of this experience and, and every crisis that feeds back into, you know, the reframing of what the problem is. And, and maybe the way Ludo just described it, maybe the reframing of this current problem is that may, you, perhaps there, are, there seem to be more black swan events occurring frequently, more frequently than, than the past. So these one in 100 year events seem to be occurring more frequently. Perhaps they are not the black swan event we hold them out to be in terms of the catastrophic impact and that if we reframe um, into thinking how do we ensure a true black swan doesn't impact us and, and wipe us out maybe that is the environment maybe it, that is the issue when you frame what the issue is you're trying to address maybe that is the issue when you come back around again that's that's the evaluation back to the engagement and reframing phase i just wanted to sort of close the loop on Okay, uh, well, let's spend the final seven minutes or so taking a look at um, the 5E framework uh, in applic being applied. Uh, so who's doing it well and who's doing it not so well? Maybe we can start first with uh, companies. 
um, as they react to uh, the pressures they're under under COVID. And if we put things, put companies into three buckets, we've got the flex folks who are the supermarkets of the world who are just scrambling to keep up. They've got so much demand and, and it, the sales are through, through the roof. There's the fix bucket that they need to um, have business models that uh, aren't suited to the times. They've been upended, so they're adapting or dying. Uh, so high-end produce suppliers to restaurants, that type of thing. And then the freeze folks, airlines, they can't do anything. They've, they're in hibernation. They are effectively unable to operate. So Peter, to begin with, uh, you've just finished teaching, uh, teaching a restructuring course at INSEAD which we could argue is a sort of straddling between the fix and freeze buckets, depending on whether you're in Singapore or in France. Um, what has the student experience been like there and, and how is INSEAD coping? Well, it's, uh, the student experience is, uh, obviously there's a lot of interest in this whole space right now and because of what is expected to follow, in the, certainly in the private sector, with, um, uh, with restructurings and corporate failures and what have you. So there's huge, huge interest um, in the program. I think what's an interesting piece of feedback is when asking uh, a group of, you know, highly motivated and, and very smart uh, MBAs what they know about the subprime crisis, for example, just by way of example, which impacted us all uh, recently, um, they're, they're, most people have never heard of that. So that, you know, I mean, what the obligation of places like INSEAD and professionals, uh, you know, in the industry uh, and leaders and boards in, in private sector and public uh, positions uh, is, to, is to actually have that memory, that institutional uh, memory that serves us. You know, you can't do any of this, um, uh, this, this phase crisis management um, if you don't remember what happened last time and 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 the, the lessons learned and the effects of it and if you treat every single one as a new discrete event we're, we're just treading water so the idea that um, the people who have that wisdom um, uh, are sitting in p positions of authority is really important I would just add to that one sort of slight um, peripheral point and, and it's it's sort of ironic it's tragic is that the, the people responsible ultimately in society for the shape of public policy in at least, you know, the democratic countries of the world are the people who are probably most adversely impacted by this. And that is the elderly again. Okay, so the people who are 60 to 80 for the last 20 to 30 years are largely responsible in terms of the, the, the structure and implementation of public health policy, uh, certainly in the West. Uh, and it is tragically ironic that now they actually suffer more. They are, as we discussed earlier, they are at the higher risk end of the spectrum with respect to this particular um, crisis. Yeah, I have, uh, I have, um, I've been impressed with uh, Bernard Arnault, LVMH in France who immediately ordered, you know, masks uh, in China very early on. And, and is basically, you know, s said, uh, we're gonna, we have all these textile workshops and we're gonna start making masks and, and protective equipment for the people in the hospitals. I mean, that is, uh, that I thought was, was amazing. And, and um, I know in France, there's a lot of discussion about the person, uh, but he's a, you know, he's, he's a remarkable person. And I like the response of LVMH. I had a student, uh, you know, I can give him, we're in, I'm the alum, alumni, so um, uh, Kostas Yazitsku from Greece, you know, who basically paid more attention to the customers and sales are growing uh, because they said, now we need to hang on to, to the students, uh, to not to the students. Uh, yeah, there is also an issue of students at INSEAD, uh, but uh, to his customers. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a remarkable quick that, you know, he says, People are actually amazingly happy because uh, we're now focused on uh, on um, on our customers in a way that we we really haven't. So this is the issue of try to use the crisis, um, you know, in a positive way. It should also be said that one of the great heroes that nobody talks about in Europe has been Greece, 
Greece has, has uh, some people say, because it is a, uh, a government of technocrats, has been dealing, uh, has, and the prime minister had no problem uh, delegating the management of the health crisis to the health people. And Greece has, a, I understand, has a very low uh, COVID rate. And, and so the Greek economy by itself is, hasn't been hit uh, either. So that's sort of uh, another example of a government which, you know, uh, did the early moves uh, correctly. And, and I think, David, that's one of the points one should uh, distinguish in crisis from a normal management. In management, sometimes people say we learn from our mistakes. That's true. But in a crisis, you can't make too many mistakes and you can't make big mistakes. Um, and so uh, I would say the Greek government probably, you know, learned from, from previous mistakes by uh, too political and went on the technical side. And so they happen to be in a, in a, in a good position. Uh, a small anecdote, I'm also chairman of a small uh, software company in oil and gas. Uh, it's a terrible uh, sector to be in. Uh, I must say uh, the team has, has a level of reality today that I've not known them for, for the last five years. Uh, they're working together. They're commercially uh, sensitive. Uh, you know, they're positive in a way that, uh, you know, uh, is, is completely new. So it's not like everybody is going down. Uh, there, are, there are ways to recover the energy, and that is what is called leadership. It's, leadership is about energies. And uh, how can you uh, use this as a way of creating more energies um, in, in the future? But these are three, three, uh, three examples. On the governments, uh, it is sort of amazing how many governments have, have um, sort of managed uh, in, a, in a light way or in a blind way for a while. And I think uh, people have been in a certain way very... Um, very human, which is we don't like our parents to fail and we don't like our governments to fail. And that's a bit of a comment that I see um, and in the numbers you showed, but it's also that uh, this crisis uh, is not a joke. So you can't hide from it. Yeah. David, can I add one thing to your framework um, that you described? Uh, of the three, the three the segments, which is the elephant in the room, and that's, that's the banking sector. There is no real recovery of these economies uh, in most countries without uh, the banks, the banking sector, you know, being involved in it, it very, very uh, pivotally. So um, I just want to put that there. It's, I know we're running out of time, but I, I thought that was important. David seems to be frozen. He gave us a high five and left, it seems. I know, I think he's frozen. I think he... <laughs> so any questions? Well, we're one minute into it. So one minute to go. I think that ends pretty much the formal uh, time that we had. Anyway, we're certainly happy to speak with alumni. We found this was use hopefully useful. And uh, if you have any comments or... Uh, or, or, you know, suggestions or questions, you know, uh, send them to us. Uh, we'll be happy to receive them and, and comment them. And uh, the idea here was to be to have a helpful document for managers in a crisis. Uh, it was not to, you know, write the best paper or whatever. It was just trying to be helpful and, and use the experience of Peter in a way that could be helpful in a more, in a more generic way. Uh, thanks, Ludo and uh, Peter. I'm uh, back after a slight technical glitch, now unfrozen. Uh, but that is indeed all we have time for today. Uh, a huge thank you to uh, Ludo and Peter for a uh, fascinating and insightful uh, webinar today on crisis management. Um, before we wrap up, uh, you'll see on the slide uh, here that uh, there is the opportunity to um, stay connected. Uh, you can engage with your fellow alumni and continue the discussion on uh, Lifelong Learning LinkedIn page. Uh, you see the link there. Uh, you can also attend our next uh, Navigating the Turbulence of COVID-19 webinars, uh, Wednesday the 29th of April, Impact Investing in the Time of Crisis, Tuesday the 5th of May, The Crisis of Organizational Change, 
and Wednesday the 6th of May, uh, secondaries market in private equity opportunities. Um, please uh, share your feedback with us. Uh, we'll be sending you a Qualitics, uh, Qualtrics sorry, survey uh, that you'll receive shortly, and also in that um, will be a link to the white paper uh, that you can download. Uh, and finally, before we wrap, um, there are a lot of people involved behind the scenes in order to make this COVID webinar series a reality, and I'd like to thank them for all of their assistance. So there's Julien uh, Boudier, Julia Contrera, Contrea, uh, Annie Ensman, Benjamin Kessler, uh, Jean-Nicolas Lafargue, uh, Zena Sleiman, and uh, Perrine Waplos. Um, a really professional team, and our thanks again. They'll be headed over to the BBC before we know it. And finally, um, uh, many thanks to you, our, our viewers, uh, INSEAD alumni, staff, faculty, uh, who've all joined in today. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay home, uh, do good and do well. Thanks very much. I'm David Mayer.